Anyway, I'm excited about our next few weeks together, and uh, we'll be looking at the book of Jonah together. So if you'd like to turn to the book of Jonah, there's four chapters, and God willing, we'll cover a chapter uh, each of the sessions that we are together. Um, I really enjoy this uh, little book. I want to, as we go through it, share a number of um, archaeological findings that substantiate some things uh, in the book and also um, some really uh, practical things I think would help us in day-to-day -day lives to live for the Lord Jesus. So let's just think about the, uh, the time frame here. We know from 2 Kings 14 that Jonah was prophesying in the, the reign of um, Israel's king in the northern kingdom of uh, Jeroboam uh, II. And Jeroboam II reigned between 1793 and 1753. And as we go through the book, I'll make a case that I think Jonah, in the situation that happens to him in the writing of this book, occurred right at the end of Jeroboam II's reign. So somewhere between 759 and, and maybe 755, those four years. And as we go through the text, you'll understand why I think it was probably this narrow uh, strip of time of three or four years. Now, Jeroboam uh, two, this would be the, the glory years of the Northern Kingdom. Jeroboam brought in uh, a greater military strength actually retaking some of the land uh, east of the Jordan that had been conquered uh, earlier by uh, Gentile nations. Uh, it was a great economic time. There's prosperity. And so that's, that's the time frame. That's the social situation that we find uh, Jonah preaching in. Um, we find out uh, in verse 1, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of uh, Ametteki, and um, he's going to be commissioned from the Lord to go to Nineveh. Well, Nineveh was the capital ci uh, city of the Assyrian Empire. At this time frame, Nineveh would have been the second largest city in the world. Uh, Babylon would have been the, the largest. Babylon would be about 250 miles south of Nineveh. And so uh, God was telling Jonah to go to the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, which was ruling um, the land of promise, the, the Jews at that time. Uh, they were the enemies of Israel. And uh, Jonah had no uh, desire to go to Nineveh uh, to preach whatever God ha would want him to preach. And so we're going to see that in this book, uh, God is quite capable of dealing with, with the prophet that's not thinking clearly, wayward prophet, in many senses. And also, uh, he knows how to uh, show mercy to an entire city. He knows how he can save pagans in a sailing ship. And so we see the sovereignty of God working on many levels uh, from the individual refining his servants to um, the propagation of a, a message that has an effect on a wide number of people. And we would expect that from our God. Uh, later in the book, we'll find out why Jonah didn't want to go in chapter four. He tells the Lord, he said, I, I knew that if you sent me and I preach what you want me to preach, and that they believed it, you would show mercy to them because you're a merciful God. And Jonah did not want God, Jehovah God, to show mercy to the enemies of Israel. Jonah wanted God to smash them. He, he wanted um, God to rid them of their enemies. But that wasn't God's plan at all. Now, as we go through each of the four chapters, and we, we find God working with his prophet, uh, in each chapter, God is going to get something out of Jonah. And I'm going to give you the outline now, so as we go through, you can see it. So in chapter one, uh, God is going to get Jonah's body. 
uh, it's gonna be secured in a big fish. Jonah is gonna head the opposite way and then goes down to Joppa and the Lord will bring a big fish and sequester Jonah's body for three days. In chapter two, God is going to get Jonah's mind. Uh, in the belly of this great fish, Jonah has plenty of time to ponder things and think about things. And we find that he starts uh, thinking about the Psalms. Actually, he refers to portions of around 10 Psalms. And so God gains Jonah's mind in chapter two. In chapter three, um, the Lord gains Jonah's obedience. He goes to Nineveh. And then in chapter four, um, God gains Jonah's heart. And so it's, it's a lovely book to show how God uh, works with his servants when they're not thinking clearly, they're not settled in his will. And it's also a great book to see how God reaches the lost. And that's a great encouragement to us. So back to chapter one, um, there's actually a, a prayer in each chapter. We'll see a prayer of the mariners here in just a minute. In chapter one, there's also, I think I counted nine miracles within the book. Um, there are three just in this first chapter. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun book to read because there's a lot of action. It's a, got a great narrative. Uh, you see God working with his prophet. You see him working in the situation to show himself to pagans. And uh, there's just a lot of personal application in it as well. So let's pick up now in verse two. This is what God tells Jonah to do. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Well, that's not what it says. That'd make a very short story. It says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went and marked this down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So God, uh, Jonah, for some reason, thinks that he can flee the presence of an of a omnipresent God. He flees the presence of the Lord. Um, Nineveh was about 550 miles uh, mainly east, a little north of uh, where he was. Uh, we know from 2 Kings that um, his hometown was Scath Heifer in Galilee, which is not too far from Nazareth, this two or three miles from uh, the city of Nazareth, the city that the Lord Jesus grew up in. Um, that's significant because you might recall that when the Pharisees were challenging the Lord, they said nothing good comes out of Galilee. No prophet came out of Galilee. Well, that wasn't true. Jonah came out of Galilee, but they didn't want to even think about Jonah because Jonah was sent to the Gentiles, and they couldn't stand that. And so from their consideration, Jonah wasn't really a prophet to be revered. Um, again, showing their cold, callous hearts and the fact that um, they had disdain on Jonah's mission and the outcome of it. So Jonah is trying to flee the presence of the Lord. He goes down to Joppa, and he, he buys fare to go to Tarshish. Um, there's some disagreement among commentators about where Tarshish is at. Um, I could make a pretty good case that it might be Britain. A number of commentators think it was Western Spain. The point is, from, from a Jewish perspective, uh, this was this far to the west as you could go, the end of the world, basically. And so Jonah is not just fleeing in the opposite direction from Nineveh. He's trying to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly can. And so he buys passage on a, on a sailing ship at Joppa. They're heading west through the Mediterranean. Notice it says he went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. Verse 5, it says he went down to the lowest parts of the ship. In chapter 2, uh, when he recounts his drowning experience, he says it went down to the moorings of the mountains. 
And so whenever we flee the presence of the Lord, uh, we can just expect to go down, down, down into misery. Uh, same thing happened with Abraham in Genesis chapter um, 12. When he um, ventures out of the promised land, the presence of God, where God promised to be with him, to resolve the situation, the crisis that he was in, it was a drought situation, uh, food was scarce, he goes to Egypt. Egypt's a symbol of the world. It says he went down into Egypt, and that's where Abraham's promise, uh, problems began. In uh, chapter 13, it said he came up out of Egypt. In that chapter, he has wonderful communion with the Lord. So whenever we flee the presence of the Lord, whenever we go in disobedience, whenever we flee into the, the world's philosophies, um, the world's thinking, the world's um, means of reconciling problems, it just creates uh, a harder situation for us, more suffering. It's when we come to our senses and come back to the presence of the Lord, come up out of Egypt, so to speak, that things get better. So this is where we find Jonah. It says in verse four, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea and lightened the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lower lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Well, Jonah's situation um, really pictures where a saint of God can get when they're out of the will of God, when they're in disobedience, they've hardened their heart to follow the Lord. We have uh, a prophet of God fleeing the presence of the Lord, the will of God, and now he's even became comfortable enough to sleep in, in a boat that's in, a, in the midst of an incredible life-threatening storm, and yet he's sleeping. Um, probably took Jonah around three or four days to get down to Joppa. It would have been about a 70, 80 mile journey from Gath Hefer in Galilee to get down to Joppa. No doubt he was probably tired, but he was a land dweller. And you put a land dweller in a boat, most people would have seasickness and, and uh, it'd be really rough being on a boat anytime. But a storm like this, in which the, the mariners, the skilled sailors, were they knew that this was a life-threatening situation, so much so they were throwing the cargo uh, out into the, the sea in order to hopefully save themselves. We find Jonah asleep. The captain has to wake him up. So again, it's, we see a prophet out of touch with reality here, out of touch with the Lord, and it just shows how far we can slide if we continue to uh, thumb our nose at God and, and go our own way. We can come very despondent. Uh, I remember talking to um, a man around 20 years ago who had been a dear believer, an evangelist, uh, but he had gotten in sin and it just captivated his heart. And he just slid further and further and further away from the Lord. And the, the consequences to those decisions were piling up. And myself and another brother uh, went to visit him. And uh, I hardly could recognize the man. Uh, he hadn't shaved, his hair was long, he was disheveled. Um, he smelled, um, uh, his eyes, there was not that twinkle and brightness and dullness about him. And um, we confronted him with his sin. And uh, he, he listened, but he was just like numb. And finally I asked him, what is it that keeps you from repenting and turning to the Lord? And he, he looked at me and almost casually said, I love my sin. I said, you love your sin more than the Lord? And he said, yeah, I do. I love my sin more than the Lord. 
And the Lord took him to the very bottom. He lost his job. He lost his wife. He lost his family. He lost everything. He lost his house and uh, took him to the very bottom. And it was a year of darkness. And then when he repented, the Lord smiled his face upon him again. And he's been in sweet fellowship ever since. Uh, we choose our sin. God chooses our consequences. And uh, so it's, it's a lesson to us. Just never say no to the Lord. Uh, always just yield, follow what he says. As soon as we step or down that slope of, of hardening ourselves and not, not being willing to do what God wants us to do, uh, we are entering in this despondency, the darkness that just gets worse and worse, and the consequences will be incredible the longer we go. So the captain says, call out on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. This is really the second miracle. The first miracle is the storm that came up really very quickly. And the second is that they cast lots and the lot rightly fell on Jonah. And so the Lord was in control of the lot. Now, I want to just say this. It's my thinking that the boat, the ship, had not sailed very far from Joppa before this storm engulfed it. And the reason for that is, one, Jonah went down into the boat. He went down to the lowest parts, and he fell asleep. And he was still asleep in the midst of the storm, which tells me it may have been three, six, maybe nine hours later, possibly, but not very long after Jonah got on the boat. And then secondly, later, um, when they uh, find out that this is uh, a really a life-threatening situation, it says they tried to row back to the land. They knew where Joppa was at, and they were trying to get back there. So I don't think that the boat, the ship had really gone very far from Joppa before uh, this um, incredible storm engulfs the ship. It wasn't a normal storm. The mariners realized that. They realized that they were in jeopardy of losing their lives. This was a supernatural thing. They were calling out to their gods. And they knew that this was not something that was normal. And that's why they cast a lot to try to figure out who's, who was angering the gods or a god. Obviously, they didn't know Jehovah God, but they knew it was something supernatural. It says in verse 8, then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So they asked Jonah five questions. Obviously, he dressed different. They knew that he was a, a Jew, wondering why they got on a Gentile ship, no doubt. And so Jonah, he comes clean. He tells him the truth. He says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. I fear Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So Jonah is rightly introducing them to the creator of land and sea. And it was the sea that threatening their lives. So now they're connecting the dots that it's Jonah's God, the creator of the sea, that is angry over uh, the situation. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Uh, why he told them, I don't know. Um, I would have thought he would have wanted to keep that quietly, but maybe he made some remarks about it. Um, he was just getting away from, from the Lord. In any case, the sailors heard him, <clears throat> and they believed him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. So the storm was get, gaining strength. Um, they had done everything they could to try to save the boat and uh, by throwing over the cargo, no doubt they may have undergirded the ship. Um, they've done all they humanly could, and yet the sea was getting uh, the storm more fierce. And so they, they were fearing for their lives. 
And since it was Jonah's God who um, caused this matter because he was fleeing from the Lord, they asked Jonah, what do we need to do to uh, avert this situation? Uh, I find the next statement by Jonah startling. He says to them, Jonah speaking to the mariners, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Um, he tells them that, that uh, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, but he didn't fear the Lord enough to obey the Lord. That's kind of an oxymoron. And then he tells him in verse 12, well, if you'll just pick me up and throw me in the sea, then all your problems will be settled and, and the tempest will be calm and you'll be saved. Um, in other words, Jonah was, he was choosing death over obedience. He would rather die than obey the Lord's will. And that's, that's where he's at. He doesn't want to see the Ninevites receive God's mercy. He wants God to judge them. And he thinks if I can just stay away from Nineveh, there'll be no possibility of God showing him mercy. And that's true to some extent. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. It has to be proclaimed. And he didn't want to proclaim it. So what he's saying here is, I would rather die than do what God wants me to do. That's a very cold-hearted attitude. But it's where the prophet is. And um, like the, the prophet Habakkuk, who was burdened in his soul, God deals with him. So by the time you get to the end of that book, he's just rejoicing. I think we looked at that in July. And uh, here we have another prophet which God is working with. And um, it says in verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land. That makes me think that they weren't that far from the land. They knew where the land was, uh, even in the midst of the storm. And and they thought they had a possibility of, of returning by rowing. But they could not, for again, the storm grew stronger and stronger against them. Verse 14, therefore they cried out to the Lord. So they were crying out to their gods earlier. Their gods couldn't do anything. They believe Jonah's story is true. They believe that Jonah's God has called, caused the problem. So now they're calling out to Jonah's God. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord, they feared Jehovah exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. So finally, seeing no other way out of the situation, the mariners, they, they wanted to save Jonah if possible, but God had caused this. Jonah had told them what to do to resolve it. Uh, they believed him, and so they asked the Lord not to lay the charge of Jonah's death to them. Um, that you would cause a storm, this is what will please you. And so they cast Jonah into the sea, and immediately the sea becomes calm. Can you imagine these seasoned veterans? Uh, been on many days uh, through the years sailing on the Mediterranean Sea. They knew the sea. And to see that storm be abated immediately and calmness, um, they knew that at that moment, that everything Jonah had said was true, and that Jehovah, Jonah's um, God, was the true God. I find it really uh, kind of comical when you think about the book. When Jonah gets cast into the sea, God saves a whole boatload of saver, sailors, and then when Jonah gets spit up out of the sea, there's a whole city that's saved from the wrath of God. Uh, God knows how to save. And so these men feared the Lord, Jehovah. They called him by name. They offered sacrifices to him. Um, they prayed to him, offered sacrifice, made vows to them, and they feared the Lord. And then we come to the, the final verse in chapter 17, 
it says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We don't know what the great fish was. Um, it might have been a well, like a sperm well, um, certainly big enough to swallow a man. Um, there are some commentators like James Vern McGee that think that Jonah died. And um, then God brought him back to life three days later, uh, substantiating the pattern that the Lord Jesus called uh, the Pharisees' attention to. Uh, Jonah is actually one of four prophets that the Lord mentions in the New Testament. He mentions Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, and Jonah. When he mentions Jonah, he says uh, they wanted a sign to believe. He said, I'll give you a sign, the sign of Jonah. And so the belly of the well typified a grave, out of sight, buried, so to speak. And uh, the Lord said, just as Jonah was in the belly of a well, or a great fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the grave. Uh, but then he would raise up after three days. And they remembered that because they went to Pilate and asked for a guard of the tomb after the Lord was crucified and buried to make sure that the disciples didn't take the body. Pilate says, make it as sure as you can. And he gave them a guard. And the Lord did raise three days later. So uh, it typifies the sign of Jonah, the three days in the belly of the, of the great fish, typifies the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It was a sign that God gave to the Jews in his time, referring to Jonah. Well, what that tells me is that that actually happened. Um, some will try to spiritualize away this story and say it didn't happen. Some have um, looked at uh, historical accounts of saying, well, sailors have been swallowed by wells and lived for a period of time, um, and then were spit up and alive. And I actually did some research into some of these things. And um, it, it's my opinion that um, most of these stories are just a well of a story, pardon the pun. Um, I don't need that kind of uh, fabricated stories to help me believe something that God's word says. The Lord Jesus referred to it. It's in God's word. That's good enough for me. Uh, we have a sovereign God who is keeping his prophet alive and conscious in this time because he's going to work on his mind in chapter two and bring him to repentance. And it, apparently it took three days to get shown to that point. We'll be discussing that in our next time together. So um, I, I don't really believe in some of these stories. Uh, one was at the end of the uh, 19th century um, uh, a man is supposedly in the belly of a fish for about a day and then um, was found alive later. But uh, looking at it, the ship that he was on was never a whaler and there's no um, register of him ever being on that ship. So again, I, it seems like it's probably a fabricated story. So I don't need those kinds of evidences to help me to believe something is true. Um, I think it's quite like it could have been a, a sperm well uh, that, that God caused to swallow Jonah. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in our next session together. So we see God at work here. Um, he has compassion upon these mariners. God knows how to save. He uses even the rebellion of Jonah uh, to bring salvation to these sailors. I believe we'll see them in heaven. Um, Maybe we'll get to talk to them about this event and hear their side of the story, get more detail. That would be fun. Uh, certainly Jonah will be there. It'll be nice to talk with him too, to see what his thinking was. Uh, but God gets Jonah's body. Matter of fact, uh, in chapter two, I would say you could summarize the chapter, Jonah goes to Nineveh via the well. Uh, God has his way. Father, we just thank you for... Um, our study tonight, we're thankful that you have your way in the storm. Um, so often we would flee the storm. We want to escape the storm. And sometimes there's uh, storms of, of training. There are storms of chastening. Uh, there's perfecting storms. Uh, Lord, sometimes you use storms just to bring your, storms just to bring your saints home. 
And uh, we pray that we would be so settled in your will, so obedient to what you want us to do, that we would not question. We just uh, go on walking with you, uh, enjoying your communion, uh, your fellowship, your power, your presence. I think of Moses, Lord, if, when he said, uh, Lord, if you don't go with us, we, there's no reason to go on. And that's really the attitude we want to have. We pray that we'd never say no, go the opposite way, it, that it only ends up in trouble, and uh, you love us too much to let us go, and you will bring us back, and it will be an expensive, painful uh, journey, and we just don't want that. So Lord, we pray that as we go through this book, we would be encouraged, we would draw the practical lessons, we pray, Father, that uh, we just be more enthralled with you and excited to serve a great God like you. So we just give you thanks now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.